Hmm. Well, flights are cheaper. But Uber is faster. Maybe a cab? Eh. There's a decent train station not far from here. You could always go down that route. <laughs> Those prices? <laughs> what do you think I am? Royalty? Bike? Maybe? <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny, really. Why, it's only been a few weeks since this whole you trying to kill me thing started. It's almost a shame that I'm going to die in a horribly explodey accident almost imminently. Yeah, it is a bit of a shame. But you should have thought of that before you trashed my theater half a dozen times and put my name through the mud. Well, hey, I didn't know destroying your home and slagging you off would affect you that much. Well, it did. And now you're going to die being horribly exploded to death. Oh, man. Man, I am so sorry. If I'd have known you didn't want your place blowing up, I'd have never tried to destroy it multiple times in the first place. You really mean that? Of course. You're the only other person who'll let me watch things on a cinema-sized screen. Why wouldn't I want to be your best bud? Ah, that was fun. Apology accepted. Well, bye. Wait, you're just going to leave me here? Well, yeah, the bomb's about to go off, and I kind of don't want to be here for that. Besides, my theater's pretty much rebuilt, and I have a grand opening to attend. But could we just do one more movie? For old time's sake. One more movie? Just one more. Well, okay. What'd you have in mind? Well, since I've taken up so much of your time this month, it, it'd only really be the right thing to do to let you choose. You really are too kind. Well, do I have that copy of Miami Connection? A perfect choice. Let's do it. So, it's come to this. 1987's Miami Connection. A film that, in a tale as old as time, was an obscure action-packed picture with a crazy background that bombed at the box office and was considered lost for years, but then got rediscovered and re-established as a cult classic for audiences to fawn over, going even so far as to have had a luxury triple-disc 4K Blu-ray release in recent years. A collaborative effort between director Wu Sang Park and YK Kim, the story goes that the pair bashed out Miami Connection, predominantly shot and actually based in Orlando Florida, go figure, in a flurry of inspiration-driven creativity. YK Kim was a somewhat famous martial artist in the Florida area with a string of successful Taekwondo studios. In fact, he was so loved that when the idea of a film came up, the local government in Florida at the time basically gave him full access to the city to shoot in any public space without the requirement of a permit. And so, with a script that appears to have been largely written in binge sessions and carte blanche to shoot where they liked, the pair got to work, with Kim bringing in students from his dojo to play most of the main cast members and extras. The filming for Miami Connection was a thrilling rip-roarer of a business. And then it all kind of went tits up. You see, Wu was only in the country for a brief time and returned to Korea almost immediately after filming Wrapped. That's all well and good, except for the fact that some of what was shot needed to be reshot, and so the legend goes, at a backer led private screening to show funders what their money had paid for, the original version had a totally different ending, which almost all of the backers strongly disliked. The resulting negative feedback left the film in a bit of a state of turmoil, because YK wasn't a filmmaker. In fact, he'd done nothing in terms of working in film up to this point apart from starring in this movie as Mark. So. He learnt. He took books out, read up on film theory and how to operate cameras, and with a skeleton crew he covered off the reshoots and rewrote and shot a completely new, happier ending that the backers were much more comfortable with. You'd think that would have solved the problem, right? Well, Miami Connection was released to a limited number of theatres, entirely distributed, promoted and fully funded by Kim himself, rumoured to be in the millions, but I'm a bit sceptical about that. And the film bombed hard. No one went to see it. The critics who could be bothered to attend screenings trashed the thing as garbage and the film failed to secure any kind of widespread home distribution, leaving Kim massively out of pocket and essentially holding an unsellable film. Jump to 2009, when a programmer for the Alamo Draft House by the name of Zach Carlson was browsing around on online auction sites and spotted a 35mm copy of some movie called Miami Connection that he'd never heard of on sale for a mere 
Carlson picked the film up on a whim and after checking it out, he put it on for a screening. Some people came, they loved it, so he screened it again. More people came. And slowly but surely the film developed a very active and invested fan base. Zack wanted to try and get the film out there to more people, and managed to find and contact YK Kim, who was still deeply hurt by the film's flop, didn't want to talk about it, and thought that the call from the Alamo Draft House were crank calls. It was only after much effort and negotiation that Kim came round to the idea that this may not be a prank, and shortly thereafter the film was released to the world for the first time as a limited home release. The results of which saw the film's popularity explode. So what's it all about anyway? Well, I've waffled on for long enough. Triv, you take the wheel. I'm trying, but trying to take the plot wheel for this movie is kind of like driving with the tentacle from 88's The Brain. It's doable, and you're proud you accomplished something outside the box, but it's not something you'll want to try twice. With that random tangent out of the way, let's dive in. We start somewhere in Miami. Imagine that where the stereotypical 80s corrupt business guys are conducting a cocaine trade. Much to their chagrin, they're ambushed by ninjas on motorcycles. If you learn nothing else from this scene, it's that you probably shouldn't bring a gun to a ninja fight. Where does this lead? Well, quite honestly, for as cool as it is, the answer is really nowhere. The 80s and cocaine go together like, well, 80s and cocaine. But the badass ninjas really don't come into play until the tail end of the final half. And the cocaine dealings really don't reappear at all. It leads into a banger credit sequence that will leave you tapping your toes to juxtaposing shots of motorcycle ninjas and hard rock and taekwondo masters in Orlando, where the white ninja and his buddy Jeff enjoy the masterful musical stylings of the mostly shirtless one, the, the only dragon style. And it's at this fateful meeting our battle of good and evil truly begins. Later, at the University of Central Florida, we catch up with Dragon Sound attending class and coding some rad circles. John and Jane flirt across the room, and later, during a recap of Jane's tragic backstory, we find out that Cocaine Lord Jeff is her brother, and he does not approve of Jane's special friend. A friend? Later, the club owner and the former house band settle their differences the way you do in Orlando. A knockdown drag out battle where someone will have their ass killed. Elsewhere, Dragon Sound chow down on some family style cooking before rocking hard about the dumb stuff that ninjas do. Upon completing a successful set, our heroes come up against the former house band and their club wielding buddies in the first of many David vs. Goliath level beatdowns. After such a high octane fight, Jim does the obvious thing. I'm taking a shower first. But is interrupted because he got a letter. Severe drama ensues. Oh, oh, letter! And the friends have a meeting to defuse the tension. We learn of Jim's past and how the rest of the band are all orpes. This highly emotional, tragic story dissolves into super happy beach fun time. And Tom suffers a tubular, obular fate. Back on campus, the lads spar, highlighting YK Kim's range of skills, including punches, blocks, kicks, fists to the mouth, and a very unique take on Got Your Nose. Jeff's gang leaves a very rude note for the lads, challenging them to a smackdown at the railroad tracks. After waiting around for ages, the next great battle of Taekwondo versus thugs begins. The fight gets broken up by a set of cops who are so caught up in the moment, they essentially pull a Plan 9 from outer space and use their guns to point at each other. The white ninja and his crew show off their tough guy credentials with motorcycles, beer, and boobs. By contrast, Dragon Sound look like they're starring in a UCF commercial. While parking their car, Tom gets kidnapped by Jeff's gang, I'm assuming because of his fabulous hair. Our heroes go all covert, and we get the next great epic showdown, After Dark. Several limbs are broken, numerous internal injuries are had, and that one guy might have gotten his ass killed with a spiked bat. But it's all good because Tom is saved, and Jeff is killed! The White Ninja intends to take revenge for Jeff's death, but first we need a banger training montage, complete with a heart-wrenching flashback. Elsewhere, Jim gets mail. And oh my god! He found his father. Regardless of being shirtless or wrapped in a towel, his bandmates share the ecstatic news with him. He gets all pimped out in a nice suit for the meeting, but the motorcycle ninjas just had to ruin the moment. Dragon Sound quickly splits up to take on the enormous group, leading to a climax you won't want to miss. Will Jim meet his much anticipated meeting with his long lost father? 
Will this guy create a new fighting style based on these moves? And where the hell is Tom? All these questions and more may be answered, but you'll have to tune in to discover them in the exciting conclusion of Miami Connection. So, as you can see, the plot of Miami Connection isn't exactly the most coherent. Its base plot of good guys are targeted by ruthless bad guys with the power of friendship conquering all is probably one of the oldest types of story archetypes in writing. The problem is this film goes off in every possible direction while trying to tell that plot. Whether it's just the guys randomly eating breakfast in their shared house for 10 minutes or the Miami ninjas riding hogs into town for a silly amount of time, the whole thing could not feel more made up and on the fly if it tried. The key driving force in this film is that Jeff, working on behalf of the Miami Ninjas, wants Dragon Sound off his turf, for some reason. It's implied he thinks that they're either dealing on his patch, or he thinks that their nice guy attitudes will ultimately lead to confrontation and an uncovering of their shady businesses. But that's never confirmed through the runtime, and Dragon Sound seem almost as confused as the audience for the most part, as they aren't selling drugs nor do they have any clue who Jeff and the Miami Ninjas are outside of Jeff being Jane's shady brother. And it's weird gaps in knowledge like that which plague this film chronically. So much of the film is basically just, don't read too much into it, just go with it, and that can be refreshingly liberating almost as much as it can be frustrating. As soon as you accept that there are going to be plot points in this that don't really go anywhere or are just happening because the film's underrunning, then things become much more tolerable. But if having a consistent plot that makes sense and ties everything up in the end is your bag, I think you may be in for a rough ride. The act structure for this picture's all over the place. There's a clear opening and closing act, but the second act isn't defined anywhere near as well as it should be. There's no real change of pace, it just kind of feels like the first act keeps going and going until the trigger point that signals the third act is happening. And that can be frustrating, because as an audience member, the act structures help to signal where the viewer is in the picture through subliminal coding. The first act is supposed to be slower as we're introduced to our core cast, maybe throw a couple of bumps in to help keep people interested, but it's expected by the audience that the first act takes its time in establishing things because, as we've seen with movies like Halloween Night and Boarding House, just info dumping 20 characters onto the audience in a 5 minute window and then expecting them to just get on with it seldom if ever works and often leaves the viewer feeling turned off by the thing before it's even really begun. The second act should have a marked change of pace, things should speed up a bit. We're familiar with our characters and the scenario that's been presented, now's the time to hit the gas and get right to the heart of the action. If you don't rev up here, or worse, you somehow manage to rev down and go slower still, your audience will get impatient wondering what's going on and why it's taking so long to actually have a point or be interesting. This should then lead to a third act, and like any good orgasm, things should be warmed up, cranked to max speed and firing on all cylinders as we arrive at the point the previous 60 or so minutes have been building to. Once you've hit that peak, you have options on how to close the film. You can either warm back down to a satisfying but steady conclusion, or you can go out with a bang keeping that high-paced speed rolling. But the important thing is that you pick a lane and stick with it, because if you don't put everything in the kitchen sink into your third act, audiences who, let's be honest, are generally not the most forgiving people in the world, will forget any goodwill they had for the opening of the film and wonder why the movie they're watching suddenly gave up and ended crap. Miami Connection opens strong, it sets the characters up, builds its world and begins to establish a scenario, and then it just kind of idles around that area with the occasional garnish of so bad it's good style delivery or brief scenarios that aren't all that relevant punted in for good measure. It means that around the hour mark when the film should be moving into its third act, I was still wondering when the second act was going to start as we get locked into a repetitive cycle of Dragon Sound getting challenged to a fight, then being confused, a fight happening anyway, the band getting the upper hand for a bit until the baddies leave or someone breaks things up, rinse, repeat. I'm not saying there isn't fun to be had with that, but that idling really stalled the viewing experience for me. It tanks the pacing, which was already screwed, but more on that shortly. And it just made my mind wander a bit until the third act suddenly jolted 50k volts into the thing. Which is fine, but when the credits rolled and the best thing I could think was, well it opened and ended well, that kind of leaves a rather large hole in the middle of this movie. 
The pacing's shonky as well. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't know how much of this script was planned well in advance and how much of it was just, we have a gap in the runtime we need to fill or I have an idea, get the camera. But there's no natural flow to the sequences in this film, scenes just kind of happen. One minute you can be watching bikers in a bar drinking beer and throwing topless women around like sacks of oatmeal, the next it could be one of Dragon Sound eating a bologna sandwich in the park talking about intercontinental friendship. And the next, it could be the owner of a club beating up a previous act. The next, it could be someone reading the mail for five minutes. Stuff just kind of happens in the order it happens in because that's how the cards have fallen. The repetition makes it even harder to really manage the pacing problems because if Jeff's gang jump Dragon Sound at 10 minutes in, when they jump them again at 25 minutes, 45 minutes and an hour in exactly the same way, intercut with shots of John doing his taxes or Mark just working out, well, it doesn't exactly instill me with the idea that these guys were making a clear and defined vision here. Again though, that isn't to say that fun isn't to be had with this thing. There are plenty of over the top, crazy, goofy and just plain odd moments that I thought were good fun, and the film does have some real charm running through it that did endear me. The on off ramblings about friendship were a definite highlight for me personally and, well, I'm always a sucker for a slightly creaky picture. I might not 100% get on with the script, but I absolutely get on with the sincerity behind it. Miami Connection has many points of strength, but the script comes up about as short as this guy's pants. The feeling of George Lucas writing the dialogue for the prequel trilogy is consistent throughout any part of the movie that isn't a fight or club scene. Humans don't necessarily speak that way, and delivering those lines convincingly would be a unique challenge for a seasoned actor, much less someone new to the game. That said, to echo one of the words that can sum up this movie clearly, everything is said with a level of sincerity that automatically softens your heart, even if YK Kim is playing a game of foot-based got your nose. I will say the level of hate Jeff and company have for Dragon Sound doesn't quite track, but it seems like there wasn't a lot of thought given to it beyond the fact that evil dislikes good so much, they'll risk all the limbs to put it out of commission as long as it doesn't interfere with drug dealing or workout time. The movie's final message of achieving world peace through the elimination of violence after the amount of unapologetic ass kicking we've witnessed over the past 90 minutes could be considered quite a head scratcher, but there are worse ways to deliver peace and love. Isn't that right, Tommy Wiseau? If a lot of people love each other, the world would be a better place to live. On the direction front, it's not bad. Not bad at all. Wu has managed to just about cultivate an interesting and largely professional looking project. Even if the script may be lacking, quite often the visual direction will help pull the film's socks up and point it in the right direction. With the Dragon Sound music videos and the end sequence in the forest being definite highlights. It's far from an engaging and studio grade experience, but compared to similar movies with similar scopes and budgets, this thing does a really solid job that made me want to come back for more. Direction of the cast by contrast is a bit more of a mixed bag, with most of the cast being made up of students from Kim's studio who'd never acted before in their lives before this. It's fair to say the film is a bit of a crapshoot as to who exactly is able to act and work to director instruction and who's here basically to make up the numbers and try their best to not completely throw the film out of whack. For the most part, it's about fine. Almost none of our core cast feel particularly natural in front of a camera. They almost all feel a bit awkward and a bit stilted and unsure as to what exactly is in frame. This is particularly noticeable in the fight scenes themselves, which absolutely have no sense of mojo. Almost like when someone's learning a dance routine for the first time, the fight choreography in almost all instances just did not flow naturally. It's almost like you can hear the cast member going, move one, okay, on to move two, okay, now move three, ace, right, move four. Which really affects the vibe and pulls you as an audience member right out of the action. While they do use soft contact here to help make the punches and kicks look at least a bit believable, sometimes they choose the wrong angles in the edit and the result makes those punches and kicks feel like they have all the weight of a feather behind them. Throw in some random effect filters such as frame dropping or slow motion and you end up with fight scenes that just feel way too heavily planned, that are being handled way too awkwardly by a cast of characters who aren't looking or feeling confident and, up until this point, weren't even actual actors. 
Direction on Miami Connection is a story of two halves for me. In terms of any scene involving martial arts, the direction feels like it's in very capable hands. Given the minds behind this, I think you'd be hard pressed to expect less. In terms of everything else, it's not bad, but you wouldn't be wrong for wanting more. As Dan mentioned above, the entire ending segment had to be done by YK Kim himself, as director Wu Sang Park returned to Korea before reshoots. He has 23 directing credits, consisting mostly of martial arts and kung fu features, set in South Korea and the US. His most well-known works are American Chinatown, Gang Justice, and our very own Miami Connection. Almost all the actors and extras were YK Kim's students, so the ability to play fight would have been a prerequisite. The camera angles do help to hide any times there might have been troubles with this. You aren't going to find a huge variety of shots used, but there was a decent pace kept up during the fight and club scenes that helped to cover most of the moments that should have been left on the cutting room floor. Mainly any time members of Dragon Sound attempted to play instruments outside of Tom and Jane. For the rest of the movie, whether it was the guys eating at a restaurant, eating at a different restaurant, driving around, or running outside in a towel, I'm not sure what to say about the direction there. It's pretty basic for pretty basic life tasks. But as you'd expect, some variation would have helped make those more low-key moments less mundane. The cine was somewhat lacking too for me. While I thought the music video sections were handled very well, everything else just feels kind of flat. We see the same shot types over and over again, which was disappointing. Experimentation is pretty much left to video effects, and given how much of the marketing emphasises cool neon 80s in its branding, there's not really a lot of that on show. Instead, most scenes are either day for night blue or just kind of beige and brown. Composition is uninspired, with basic framing applied and seldom anything else. They don't really follow traditional shot setups, and it feels like the crew knew how to do two lighting setups, day for night and floodlit, because that's all there is here, honestly. Performance-wise, Luke, no one gets out of this with much in the way of dignity. The only standout performers for me in this were Kim and Maurice Smith as Jim. And it's not because they're brilliant performers, it's because they're the cast members who I feel would most fit into an episode of Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. The rest of the cast range from muted to awkward to just plain weird. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but on the whole, if you're not one for cheesy oddness in your action movies, firstly, what are you doing watching 90% of the commercially available action movies, but secondly, this maybe isn't your rodeo. For my money, the performances by and large were either very overstated A friend. or quite understated. This damn gang selling the stupid cocaine. But the one thing you can say is that they were sincerely giving it their all. As stated above, sometimes the dialogue does meander into prequel trilogy levels of awkward, but it's done with such heart that I find it hard to judge them harshly for doing their damnedest to deliver lines with conviction. The most natural acting you're going to see are the roughly 100 bikers paid in beer during the motorcycle bar scene. Booze was definitely to thank for lubricating their acting gears. According to the commentary, some of the dialogue, especially that of Jeff's younger gang members, was left somewhat open-ended so actors could speak more naturally, which gives the gift of banger lines like... Salami. <laughs> bye bye! <laughs> this ain't considered a cheesy movie for nothing, folks. Additionally, the last 20 minutes grace us with no less than three screams worthy of Willem. <laughs> and that makes me really happy. And finally, the soundtrack. Come on man, it's Dragon Sound, 80s pop rock at its finest. Seriously, if you want the quickest way to figure out if this movie is for you, go and boot up a spare tab and look up their track Friends. It was one of the first songs in this movie and it's incredible. Very much in the camp of The Shimmy Slide in terms of some of the most iconically funny and weird but damn good music ever put to film. And that pop rock edge envelops this whole movie. Seriously, this is one hell of an OST, and I seriously regret not nabbing it on vinyl when I had the chance. Even if you've never heard of Miami Connection, you've probably heard the musical stylings of Dragon Sound, the new dimension in rock and roll. The song Friends has become iconic enough to appear in numerous other projects, including Scare Package 2, Ping Pong Summer, and Far Cry 3. The music and lyrics of Friends and Against the Ninja were written and performed by two of YK Kim's musically talented students, Angelo Gennati and Kathy Collier. 
Miami Connection somehow managed to get a very limited VHS release at some point in the very late 80s or the very early 90s, though even collectors aren't 100% on exactly when that release came out. It was distributed by a company by the name of Liberty Entertainment Group, and after that it fell into total obscurity until 2012, when it was issued on Blu-ray by Drafthouse Films. That quickly went out of print and started going for silly money, and throughout the 2010s the film would get multiple releases as limited edition VHS throwback style issuings. Finally, in 2022, like buses, we got not just one, but two separate releases of Miami Connection within months of each other after a near decade long drought. One being from Umbrella Entertainment, which was just a standard Blu ray release, and the other being a three disc 4K Blu ray box set released by Vinegar Syndrome, which is the version I own. And this thing's just gorgeous. While I personally didn't see that much difference between the Blu-ray and 4K versions, I put that more down to a bloody good job having been done on the Blu-ray release than a shoddy job being done on the 4K disc. When you consider that the original negative for this film was destroyed in 2004 and that this was a bit of a patchwork restoration, it's understandable that this wouldn't exactly be immaculate. The first two discs contain the 1080p and 4K versions of Miami Connection alongside commentaries, making ofs and much much more. The third Blu-ray disc contains an early cut of the movie with alternate scenes and other oddities which is perfect for the average die-hard Miami Connection fan who wants to try and see the film from a new perspective. Perspective. My first exposure to this was through Rift Tracks, and for as many times as I've seen it, I still relate strongly back to it as part of my viewing experience. During the Taekwondo exhibition, I can't help but think about how Mark goes from sparring with one tall, goofy white guy to another tall, goofy white guy. I'm so grateful that the guys behind Alamo Draft House found Miami Connection and gave it a second chance at things. It is such an endearing movie, made by a community of people that really wanted to say something. And although the message was initially swept into the void of time, it came roaring back through the most unlikely of circumstances, to give people equal parts humor and roundhouse kicks to the face. Its music, sincerity, and superior Taekwondo skills will definitely leave you saying, Oh my god! And if you're looking for a good night of riffable 80s style ass kicking, you can pair this with a side of Samurai Cop. Shouty villains, lost limbs, and great hair await. Ultimately, while Miami Connection is an absolute hoot with some really fun moments, solid direction, and just daft and over the top performances that charmed and enthralled me, it wasn't one that ultimately won me over. I enjoyed it, I'd watch it again, but I didn't out and out love it. Your mileage may vary, however, and I hope that what both me and Triv have said here will help you make an informed decision. But for me, while I had a bit of a soft spot for Miami Connection, I didn't feel like I out and out loved it in the way that many other fans of this movie do. It absolutely had its moments and the soundtrack's amazing, but that second act is such a hodgepodge of repetition and the cine varies in quality so much throughout that, pound for pound, I just think there are better strange action movies out there. This would probably pair really well with something like Day of the Panther as a double feature, but it wouldn't strictly be something I think I'd watch on its own. Not for a while to come, at least. Ah, the classics are still the classics. <laughs> you can say that again. You know, if I have to get reduced to tiny fragments of dust and bone, this was probably the best way I could have gone. Eh, don't mention it. Well, maybe we can do it again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm such a stinker. Anyway, you take care. I'm out of here. Hey, you take care, man, and thanks again. Anytime. Oh god, oh god! I'm too, too dimensional to die! <laughs> wait, 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 wait. This isn't my parcel bomb. Your... what? My parcel bomb. This isn't... this isn't even plugged in. And the numbers are just painted on? Oh, yeah, no, that's just a comedy parcel bomb I keep around for jokes and cocktail parties. What? Where... Then where the hell is my parcel? Your parcel? Um... Oh, that thing! Yeah, they wanted to charge me $50 as a custom fee for it. Sod that, I sent it back to the sender. You did what?!